Uh, Revelation chapter 5. And don't pay any attention to the screen, because that is for the message this morning. This morning, I lost, I lost my notes, believe it or not, for what I was going to go with this morning. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go from memory, and I'm going to wing it this morning. Revelation chapter 5, I want us to read uh, at least half of this and get the gist of it. And then we'll, uh, we'll go through the Bible and look at some things. Revelation chapter 5, I know we've been here for a while, but that's sort of what we're doing. Uh, again, the book of Revelation to me is an index to the rest of the Bible. The rest of the Bible is going to point you, it's going to open up to you what these things are that's happening in, in Revelation. Uh, I saw on the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside sealed with seven seals. I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof and no man in heaven nor in earth uh, neither under the earth was able to look was able to open the book neither to look thereon and I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And then one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb. Notice that is a capital L. The Lamb. And if I remember right, and if somebody can look this up for me, John, maybe you can do this. The word Lamb with a capital L, if I remember right, I think it's 28 times in the King James Bible. Look that up and see if I'm right. With a capital L. That would be... What's 28? A multiple of. And four. Did you find it? I'm right. See, I'm not, I haven't lost it all. 28 times. Capital L. Four, seven for perfection. That's God's number. Four because he's the lamb in the four gospels. Behold the lamb of God which taketh away the sins of the world. Uh, stood a lamb as it had been slain. And that's true. The lamb has already been slain. Having, and this is, this is weird to us, but this lamb has seven horns and it has seven eyes. Now that sounds kind of weird. We're not used to seeing anything like that. But what, what do you think this lamb, what do you, why do you think it has seven eyes? What does that number seven tell you? If you were to just think of what eyes do, what the number seven means. Huh? God sees everything. That's it right there. With seven eyes, you see... Um, science has noticed that a lot of animals we're not one of them our eyes are on the front of our face but animals that have a lot of predators usually have eyes on the side of their head so they can see what's coming up behind them okay uh you ever seen certain spiders where they've got like i don't know how many Eyes of spider head, but yeah, they got a bunch of them in there. They can detect the slightest movement of anything, and that's that's going to be their meal. So I think the symbolism of the seven eyes represents the fact that God sees everything. Now, uh, years ago, a few years ago, I had to I had to study a false prophet named Finnis Dake. Have you ever heard of Dake's Annotated Reference Bible? Don't buy it. 
is a waste of money and the guy is a total false prophet. But most, in fact, I, most of your charismatic churches, teachers, preachers, uh, TBN type people, they follow Finnis Dake. They believe everything he said. Finnis Dake said that God obviously doesn't see everything that goes on and he doesn't know every event that happens. He, he doesn't. And he said, here's the proof that when in the book of Job, when God has all the angels gathered there and Satan comes also among them, God asks him, you know, from whence comest thou? And Satan says, from walking up and down in the earth and to and fro in it. In other words, Dake was saying that God obviously didn't know where the devil was. So he had to ask him. And that God sends angels out all throughout the universe to find out everything that's going on and they come back and report to him what's going on. That's stupid. If my God isn't smart enough to know what's going on everywhere at all times, I'm not going to follow him. He's not much of a God. Amen? Amen. But anyway, I, the, I believe the seven eyes represent... Um, and, and we're given a clue here in this same verse. It says, stood a lamb, verse 6, stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. Now, let's do this. Let's take these seven horns and these seven spirits. Uh, first of all, let's go to Isaiah chapter 11. This will be the seven spirits of God. They're listed in the Bible. <clears throat> and see, there's, these are things that we don't, that we believe, but we don't quite understand. We know that God is one. And we also know that Jesus said, I and the Father are one. And yet, Christ was obedient to his Father. We also know that the Holy Spirit and Jesus and God the Father are one. And yet, when on the day that Jesus was baptized in the River Jordan... You had all three of them present. You had the voice coming from heaven saying, this is my beloved son. That was the father. You had the son coming up out of the water. Then you had the Holy Spirit as a dove lighting upon his, his shoulder. So all three were present there. They were all different entities. And yet they are one. There's one God. Now, I don't understand that. But I believe it. Yes, David. Right. The DNA, I mean, it would be sent to bring them. Mm-hmm. It would be sent to all of that to some other picture. Yeah, I, I see what you're saying, that they're, you know, like David's family is one family. Okay? But then you have to be careful about the doctrine, I forgot what it's called, tritheism where you actually have three different gods. And, and again, getting back to Finnis Dake, let me show you how way off this guy was. Finnis Dake said that all three members of the Godhead 
each themselves consisted of spirit, soul, and body. Three parts. So how many you got now? Nine. You got God, God's spirit, God's soul, God's body. You've got the Son's spirit, the Son's soul, the Son's body. And then you have the Holy Spirit, spirit, and the Holy Spirit's soul, and the Holy Spirit's body. That's stupid. It's ridiculous. But that's the kind of stuff this guy come up with. And people just believe what he said. He's the guy that said that if you get sick, if you're born again, and you get sick, and die, you're going to hell. Because getting sick is the same as sin, and in his eyes, when you sin, you lose your salvation. Every time you sin, you lose your salvation. That's what he said. That's called repeated regeneration. That means that every time you sin, you have to confess your sin and then get your salvation back. Yeah. Exactly. That's, that's what he believed. And I'm just going, uh, no, it doesn't work that way. And Dake, Dake is the one. He started this movement of if you're saved, you will be healthy and wealthy. But if you are sick, it is a sign that you are not saved and you have a devil in you making you sick and if you can't if you don't have the faith to cast that devil out of you or believe that God can heal you then you die in a lost condition now God has a sense of humor I looked up how Finnis Dake died and Dake said that all Christians should die as Moses. Moses was 120. And the Bible says he had his full life force in him. There was nothing wrong with him. There was no sickness in him. There was nothing wrong. God just took him. Dake died of Parkinson's disease. You ever known anybody who's had Parkinson's disease? It takes a long time to kill you. In the last few months of your life, you're an absolute pain they have to keep you doped up that's how preacher golf died parkinson's disease and i asked sister judy you know how how things have been going i was at the funeral and she said mike he was in so much pain they just kept him dope up on morphine until he died and uh i think god did that to him on purpose to show everybody if the guy who says this didn't have enough faith for three years at least to get rid of this Parkinson's disease, then what does that tell you? And a lot of these, uh, these other faith healers too who tell everybody you ought to be healthy all the time and you can get rid of sickness out of your life. They die of cancer. They die of heart disease. They die of all kinds of stuff, all kinds of diseases that they say you're not supposed to have. Anyway, let me move on. So then we get to the seven spirits of God. There's one spirit. And yet, there's the seven spirits of God. In Isaiah chapter 11, um, verse 1, There shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch, capital B, that's Christ, shall grow out of his roots. He's the branch. And then it says in verse 2, the Spirit of the Lord, these are the seven spirits of God listed for you. Number one, the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. Number two, the Spirit of wisdom. Number three, and understanding. Number four, the Spirit of counsel. Number five, and might. Number six, the Spirit of knowledge. And number seven, of the fear of the Lord. So there are the seven spirits of God listed for you uh turn you're in isaiah turn to isaiah let's see here where do i want to go isaiah 61 
This is a prophecy concerning Christ, the Lamb. And he says in verse 1 of Isaiah 61, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn. Now hold your place there in Isaiah 61, and turn to Luke 4. Jesus is going to read this. He's going to read this part of the scriptures in the synagogue. Um, the first part of Luke chapter 4 is when the devil uh, is tempting him. Um, you know, turn these stones into bread, what have you. By the way, who remembers back in the 80s when all the rock stars got together and made that song, US, We Are the World. We are the children. Remember that song? Do you remember Willie Nelson's part? I didn't know Willie Nelson was a rock star, but he, anyway. You remember, you remember Willie Nelson's part in that song? As God has shown us by turning stones to bread. Now, show me a place in the Bible where God turned stones into bread. There isn't a place, but I can tell you a place where the devil tempted God to turn stones to bread. Dun, dun, dun. Luke 4. Whoever wrote that lyric, and I think it was Quincy Jones, I think he wrote the whole song. Way off, way off in his doctrine. Now, in verse 16, Jesus, he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went up into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of, I, of the prophet Isaiah. Now, Isaiah has 66 chapters. Your Bible has 66 books. There's a connection here. Huh? Yeah, right. So what you're seeing here is a foreshadowing of Jesus taking the book from his father's right hand and opening it. That's what we're seeing in Revelation 5 and 6. And so, so it says in verse 17, There was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah, and when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. Verse 18, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. That's Isaiah 61. Because he hath anointed me to preach um, the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty uh, them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Now, if you look at verse 19, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord, and you look back in Isaiah 61, um, in verse 2, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, you'll notice that Jesus stopped mid-sentence. He stopped right in the middle of the sentence. He didn't, he didn't read, and the day of vengeance of our God. He didn't read that. He said to preach the acceptable year of the Lord, and then it says, and he closed the book. Boom. What was he doing there? He's telling everybody that now is the acceptable time. Now's the time that if you want to give your life to Christ, if you want to be saved, if you don't want to die and go to hell, if you don't want to be a partaker of God's wrath because of your sins, now is the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closes the book. But what is he going to do at the last days, 
He's going to take the book again, open it back up, finish reading that verse, and the day of vengeance of our God. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. So if you think if you think, you people here, you people online, if you think that you're going to wait until, I'm going to wait till it gets really bad, then I'll get saved. Or I'm going to wait for a while, I'm going to still have my fun, and then I'm going to get saved. You don't know when that's going to happen. He will come as a thief comes and the thief never knocks on the door to announce his coming. He comes in, sneaks in some other way. Okay? Who remembers uh, what they call him, the, the South Side Rapist? Y'all remember him? He was a guy that raped a bunch of... It was basically older women up around South St. Louis. And his, you remember him, his modus operandi was, he just kind of went up and down neighborhoods and saw who lived where. And he would go to the house two or three o'clock in the morning and just check for an open window. Usually could find one. And he'd slip in that window and go in there and rape that woman and leave. And nobody ever saw him. Nobody ever knew who it was till they finally caught him. Evil man, evil guy. But it could happen just that quickly, and you're not going to know when it's going to happen. Just like the people in Noah's day who were beaten on the side of the ark, let us in, let us in, let us in, and they're not getting in. It's too late. God's wrath is being poured out. So, now... Back in Revelation 5. This, I know this is strange to you because I'm, don't put, I'm not putting any verses up on the screen for you to read. It'll make you look them up in your Bible. With him having uh, seven horns, and those seven horns represent the seven spirits of God. Let's look at a story, another story, another part of the Bible that portrays that. Turn to Judges, chapter 16. Who remembers Samson? Remember Samson? And when the angel of the Lord appeared to Manoah, who was Samson's father and Manoah's wife, and told them that they were going to have a, a man-child from the Lord, and what were, they, what were they not supposed to do? Or allow him to do. He's never supposed to put a razor to his head. No, he had to grow beard, mustache. Never was never to cut his hair. Uh, and basically, he was he followed the Nazarite vow. The Nazarite vow, is, I think, it's given in the book of Numbers. And the Nazarite vow says you cannot eat uh, anything fruit of the vine. You cannot you cannot drink. Wine, grape juice, you cannot eat raisins, can't eat grapes. Um, you cannot touch anything that's dead. And I don't remember what all else, but there's a few things that you just could not do. You were to separate yourself. And think about what the Bible says about a man with long hair. What does the Bible say about that? It is a shame. So let's say that Samson is a type of Christ. And it is a shame for a man to have long hair. That tells us that it's a, it's a picture of Christ bearing our shame and our reproach 
when they nailed him to the cross. Okay, that's what that's a picture of. And in this case, how did Samson comb his hair? It tells you. How did he have his hair arranged? Okay. Something, how many? Seven. The seven locks of Samson are the seven horns that the lamb has in Revelation 5, which represent what? The Spirit of God. Because when the seven locks were cut off, he lost his power, his strength. But after they had held him in prison for a while, what started happening? Began to grow back and the spirit came upon him, didn't it? So the seven spirits of God were related to those seven locks of hair that he had. Those seven locks are a representation of the seven horns that the lamb has in Revelation chapter 5. And you look at Judges 16. We'll read just a few places here. Look at verse 13. Delilah said unto Samson, Hitherto thou hast mocked me and told me lies. Tell me wherewith thou mightest be bound. And he said unto her, If thou weavest the seven locks of my head with the web... And she fastened it with the pen and said unto him, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he waked out of his sleep and went away with the pen of the beam and with the web. And she said unto him, How canst thou say I love thee when thine heart is not with me? Thou hast mocked me these three times and hast not told me wherein thy great strength lieth. And it came to pass when she pressed him daily with her words. Now people, there's a, there's a great lesson in this. The seven spirits of God to us are this Bible, purified seven times, sealed with seven seals. The Holy Ghost, Jesus said, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. If anybody comes to me with a problem, anybody comes to me with an issue, anybody comes to me, Pastor, I don't understand this. I'm going to give you scripture to read. Or I'm going to tell you, you open your Bible up and you start reading until you start finding answers. Because what happens with us is that the devil presses us daily, doesn't he? She pressed him with her words. She was vexing him. Vexation is... What happened to Lot when he had to live in Sodom? And he had to see the men and the women of Sodom doing their filthy wickedness in front, in public probably, every day. And it vexes you. You, you just, you're either going to have to stay there and become part of them or you're going to have to leave. And I get calls from people, especially I had, I remember a conversation I had with a family in California. And they said, we can't take it anymore. We cannot take it anymore. This place, California, is absolute pure evil. Uh, a family that lives up in, um, close to Seattle. They said, we just, it, it's awful up here. Drugs everywhere, liberals everywhere. And they said, it's a mess. We're, we're probably just going to have to get out of here one of these days. Because after a while, it'll turn you, they'll turn you into one of them if you're not careful. And here, Delilah is pressing him every day. Pressing him, pushing him, pushing him, pushing him. Tell me your secret. Tell me your secret. Tell me your secret. And eventually, what did he do? And then what did she do? Cut the seven locks off. And that's what happens when the devil starts pressing us with whatever sin he deals with you with, he vexes you with, he presses you, whatever weakness you have. 
He's going to push and push and push and push until you're either going to have to stand up against him or he's going to take over. I remember, I'm going to, I know the bell rang, I, I've told this story before, but I used to go back behind here and pray back years ago. And it was just me back there. And sometimes people didn't know where I was. I was back here praying. I remember there was a time, man, I, I was, the devil was pressing me and pushing me every day. Would not let up to leave, to get out, go on, get out of here. And I finally, I went back there and I, 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 I mean, I'm about to go crazy. God, I can't take this anymore. And God reminded, this is really the first time that I really recognize this. The Holy Ghost quoted this, the verse, smite the shepherd and the sheep would scatter. And I realized, Brother George, that it had nothing to do with me. It had everything to do with this church and its people. The devil wanted to get to them but he couldn't as long as I was in the position that I was, spiritual authority. And when it dawned on me, I mean, he was even telling me, leave your wife and kids, get out. And I couldn't take it anymore. And when the, when the Holy Ghost said, Mike, smite the shepherd and the sheep will scatter. I did, I stood up. And I said, I'm not leaving. How's that? And I began to pray in the Lord. And buddy, victory came. They scattered. Devils fled. Because I stood against them. Every now and then, you're going to get weak. And I'm going I'm to keep preaching on this power thing. People are going to exert power over you and they're going to press you and they're going to push you and they're going to vex you and they're going to try to control you. You stand against them. And if you don't have the power to do it, I know somebody that does. Amen? Father, bless your word today. We thank you for it. Father, I ask for your help today in preaching, Lord, what I believe you've laid on my heart. Do it for these people's sake. And for these online, for these people in Kenya. Father, there's evil people surrounding us everywhere and they're not going away and they're getting worse. I pray, dear God, that you would bless your people today. Give us strength to carry on, we pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen.